I'm Carl Kies, I'm the CEO of Red Radar Systems and today I'm going to give a bit of a presentation on a book I read recently called The Boys in the Boat by Daniel James Brown. It's basically a book about nine young Americans and their epic quest for gold at the 1936 Berlin Olympics and I found the book fascinating, inspirational and with some very interesting lessons in terms of leadership and teamwork. This book was born on a cold, drizzly, late spring day when I clambered over the split rail cedar fence that surrounds my pasture and made my way through wet woods to the modest frame house where Joe Rantz lay dying. Okay, Joe Rantz is the main character in the book, one of the rowers in the team, and this book is about him and how he fits into the, 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 the whole story. And this is another author speaking. I knew only two things about Joe when I knocked on his daughter Judy's door that day. I knew that in his mid-70s, he had single-handedly hauled a number of cedar logs down a mountain, then hand-split the rails and cut the posts and installed all 2,224 linear feet of the pasture fence I had just climbed over. A task so Herculean, I shake my head in wonderment whenever I think about it. And I knew that he had been one of nine young men from the state of Washington, farm boys, fishermen and loggers, who shocked both rowing world and Adolf Hitler by winning the gold medal in eight order rowing in the 1936 Olympics. So that just gives you the, the, the tone of the book with an introduction. So to start, I would like to just play you a video. But if you don't get that single soul emerging, it won't work whatsoever. But when it works, you get all this strong energy clicking together. When we are born, we are little babies and the world is us. It takes a long time for us to get out of that mode to realize but we're actually just beings in a, in a bigger context. If we want to function in the world as humans, we've got to join forces with each other and form teams. Without teamwork, we can't achieve anything. And we need to have an efficient, efficient team to, to be successful. Some of the interesting things about highly effective teams is that I've never seen one just form by itself. For that team to form and to click and to gel, you need leadership. Because that team needs to be inspired, motivated, empowered, and it needs a shared vision and a shared goal. To, to achieve that. So there is the, the boys in the boat. Eight strong, tough rednecks grew up in woods chopping logs and doing all sorts of stuff which you'll read in the book. And there's the coxswain, small, light little guy, but I think he's had the biggest balls of them all. So this is what the book is about, the team, and what made the team gel. So in the book, Brown tells the true story of the University of Washington oarsman Joe Rantz, which I already introduced in the beginning, and the other boys in the boat who defeated the Nazis at the 1936 Olympics. And the Yoda-like spiritual guru of the story, the, the legendary uh, shell builder George Yeoman Pocock, plays a central part in the book. At each chapter in the beginning, there's a quote from him. And, and he was kind of like, the, I think, the, 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 the rowing counselor or coach for, for the boys. Every, rowing, every good rowing coach imparts the kind of self-discipline required to achieve the ultimate from mind, heart, and body. Which is why most ex-oarsmen will tell you they learned more in the, race, the racing shell than in the classroom. This is one of his quotes. What we learned from his involvement in that 1936 year is that formal rank and amazing competence are not in direct proportion to each other. Those in power often need to look to those in the organizations who can contribute at a higher level and let them do so, regardless of the organizational structure. Everyone in the organization can lead and leadership is not tied to formal positions. So I think that's an important lesson out of this book. So in a sport like this, hard work, not much glory, well. There must be some beauty which ordinary men can't see, but the extraordinary men do. We've already quoted that in the beginning, but this is the thing about rowing is that it doesn't just come by itself. It takes very hard work, and, and you need special people to see that. 
And that basically comes down to what a really good team needs, is it needs to have a shared vision. And the responsibility of a leader is to create that vision and to impart that vision to his team. It's hard to make the boat go as fast as you want to. The enemy is the resistance of the water. But that very water is what supports you and that very enemy is your friend. So is life. The very problems you must overcome also support and make you strong in overcoming them. So adversity makes you stronger. And no great success happens without rising to overcome challenges. And, and, but this is made easier with, with having that goal, that big, heavy goal, the BHAG, some of you might have heard of. So we already said this to a certain extent, that rowing a race is an art. Rowed with head power as well as with hand power. All thoughts of the other crew must be blocked out. Your thoughts must be directed to you and your own boat. So the boys had an acronym for this, MIB. Mind in boat. It holds true in business too. So you must keep your eyes on what you're doing and an eye on where your customer is going. Rowing is perhaps the toughest of sports. Once the race starts, there are no timeouts, no substitutions. It calls upon the limits of human endurance. The coach must therefore impact or impart the secrets of the special kind of endurance that comes from mind, heart, and body. But the other part of this is that you shouldn't micromanage. You can only provide guidance, inspiration, and leadership at the start and whenever necessary. But otherwise, let the team get on with it. So in that sense, people get responsibility while the race is in progress. And they can push themselves to their own limits. And that will bring out the best in them. It's a sensitive thing, an eight old shell. And if it isn't let go free, it doesn't work for you. So what you must do is provide coaching, guidance, inspiration, and leadership at the start and when required. But give people the responsibility while the race is occurring and let them drive themselves to their limits. It will allow them to be the best that they can be. So one of the first characteristics of a good rowing coach is to pull your own weight. And the young oarsman does just that when he finds out that the boat goes better when he does. That's one of the big lessons that, that uh, the character in the book had to, to learn, is he had to let go of his ego and um, click with the team. And, and therefore, individuals must be held accountable and responsible, that they must be parts and members of the team. And reward them if they deliver. If they can't, replace them with someone who can. And sometimes that's a bit harsh. But I mean, it's, it's a fact of life. To, to build the best team, you need to have the best people in the team. And also in the book, you'll see how the coach builds this team over time. But when you get the rhythm in an eight, it's pure pleasure to be in it. It's not hard work when the rhythm comes. That swing, as they call it. I've heard men shriek when that swing comes in, in an eight. It's a thing they'll never forget as long as they live. But it also comes back to, to create that is that you need to plan, execute, monitor, and repeat. So when you build and empower a team to do this, there's no limit to what they can achieve working together. So people call it different things, a sense of flow, a relaxed or creative state, but this perfect comfort and trust of one's environment is essential to maximum efficiency, productivity, and joy. So to be of championship caliber, a crew must have total confidence in each other confident that no man will get the full weight of the pool. So this is a nice link up with the trust. And this means that that goal must be aligned across the entire team. Everybody in the team must be part of that goal and they must contribute. It's true in many team sports. So anybody who can't see or support the shared vision or goal can bring the entire team down with them. And in some management environments, you get individuals in the team that deliberately obstruct the team. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. And one of my lessons, lessons I learned is that when that happens, don't tolerate that. Get that person out of the team immediately. The longer you let that person in the team, the worse the team comes. People start arguing, fighting, bickering, and there is just no performance, and this team just becomes a disaster. My ambition has always been to be the greatest shell builder in the world. I believe I have attained that goal. If I were to sell the stock, I feared I would lose my incentive and become a wealthy man, but a second-rate artisan. I prefer to remain a first-class artisan. 
So when you wish to be the best at something first, wealth follows. The reverse of this story is also often, uh, this is not often so certain. The ability to yield, to bend, to give way, uh, to accommodate, was sometimes a source of strength in men as well as in wood, so long as, as it was helmed by inner resolve and by principle. And leadership then in that sense works from the inside out, it starts inside. Managers focus on tasks, relationships and processes that take place outside of the individual. It's, it's sort of the, the organization and logistics of the environment within an organization. And not many leaders have the power or confidence to take on these spiritual elements that unfold within a person. Rowing is, in a number of ways, a sport of fundamental paradoxes. For one thing, an eight-oared racing shell powered by unusually large and physically powerful men or women is commanded, controlled and directed by the smallest and least powerful person in the boat, the coxswain. Another paradox lies in the physics of the sport. The objective of the endeavor is, of course, to make the boat move through the water as quickly as possible. But the faster the boat goes, the harder it is to row well. The enormously complicated sequence of movements, each of which an oarsman was execute with exquisite precision, becomes exponentially more difficult to perform as the stroke rate increases. At the same time, the exertion required to maintain high rate makes the physical pain all the more devastating and therefore the likelihood of a miscue greater. But the greatest paradox of the sport has to do with the psychological makeup of the people who pull the oars. I think this is actually where the, the crux of it starts. Great oarsmen and oarswomen are necessarily made of conflicting stuff, of oil and water, fire and earth. On the one hand, they must possess enormous self-confidence, strong egos and titanic willpower. They must be almost immune to frustration. Nobody who does not believe deeply in himself or herself in his or her ability to endure hardship and to prevail over adversity is likely even to attempt something as audacious as competitive rowing at the highest levels. The sport offers so many opportunities for suffering and so few opportunities for glory that only the most tenaciously self-reliant and self-motivated are likely to succeed at all. And yet, at the same time, and this is key, no other sport demands and rewards the complete abandonment of the self the way the drawing does. Great crews may have men or women of exceptional talent or strength. They may have outstanding coxswings or strokes, stroke oars or bowmen, but they have no stars. The team effort, the perfectly synchronized flow of muscles, oars, boat and water, the single hull, unified, and the beautiful symphony that a crew in motion becomes is all that matters, not the individual, not the self. Few rowing coaches would simply clone their biggest, strongest, smartest and most capable rowers. Crew races are not won by clones, they are won by crews. And great crews are carefully balanced blends of both physical abilities and personality types. Only in this way can the capabilities that come with diversity, lighter, more technical rowers in the bow and stronger, heavier pullers in the middle of the boat, for instance, be turned to advantage rather than disadvantage. And capitalizing on diversity is perhaps even more important when it comes to the characters of the oarsmen. A crew composed entirely of eight amped up, overly aggressive oarsmen will often degenerate into a dysfunctional brawl in a boat or exhaust itself in the first leg of a long race. Similarly, a boatload of quiet but strong introverts may never find the common core of fear resolve that causes the boat to explode past its competitors when all seems lost. Good crews are good blends of personalities. Someone to lead the charge, someone to hold something in reserve, someone to pick a fight, someone to make peace, someone to think things through, someone to charge ahead without thinking. <laughs> Somehow all this must mesh. That's the steepest challenge. Even after the right mixture is found, each man or woman in the boat must recognize he saw her place in the fabric of the crew. So yeah, for me that's a nice summary of, of the book, where strong individuals, strong diverse individuals pull together to form a team. 
it was fun to prepare this and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll be here for another 10 minutes. Thanks a lot.